was a bungalow that we discovered on City Island in the Bronx, which is New York City. Um, it's the first Sears home recognized by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, which is a pretty amazing fact given the popularity of the mail order home in the early 20th century. So as soon as we began our research into Sears houses, we began to see them everywhere, even here at Red Hook. <laughs> Uh, it seems that here um, on just about every street you can see some likely suspects, um, houses that have that catalog look about them like maybe you've seen them somewhere else before. Um, but before we get to our tour of Red Hook's catalog houses, we'd like to give a little background on the history of the or and the origins of the mail order house in America. The mail order house can be traced as far back as the 17th century when prefabricated structures including settlers' cottages, hospitals, government buildings, churches, and a slew of other building types were transported globally across land and sea to serve the needs of colonial settlements. Typically composed of wood or iron panels bolted together on site, prefabricated structures could be erected or knocked down quickly and without specialized tools. During the 19th century, the British Empire shipped prefabricated buildings to every continent on the globe. In America, prefabricated structures were used during the California Gold Rush of 1849, and later on they played an important role in settling the American West after the Civil War. Another important influence on the development of the mail order house in America was the architectural pattern book of the mid-19th century. These books were meant for the prospective homeowner and presented quaint illustrations and detailed descriptions of the moral and aesthetic virtues of the various house types and styles. The patterns ranged from a simple farmer's cottage to the gentleman's country villa. As a genre, the pattern book was shaped and promoted by two important figures in the history of architecture and also of the Hudson Valley, namely landscape designer A.J. Downing and architect A.J. Davis. Davis's Delameter House in Rhinebeck, built in 1844, is perhaps the quintessential pattern book house. Towards the end of the 19th century, the popular magazine played an even more important role than the pattern book in educating the American public about domestic architecture. These magazines featured many house plans borrowed from different pattern books or directly commissioned from architects, and marketed them to a nation of aspiring homeowners, <coughs> targeting women in particular as the primary household consumer. Selling house plans through popular magazines was a trend that continued well into the 20th century with publications such as House Beautiful, Good Housekeeping, and The Ladies' Home Journal and it was the model that ultimately formed the basis for the mail-order house. The mail-order house took one giant step forward, however, by offering the house itself along with the plans. A true mail-order house is considered to be one in which the plans, the framing lumber, the millwork, and interior fixtures and finishes, the whole kit and caboodle, are sold from the catalog as a package or kit and shipped by rail directly to the home buyer for assembly on site. Often, but not always, the framing lumber was pre-cut and fitted at the factory. Several companies began in the mail order home business around the turn of the 20th century, most of them located in the Midwest um, because of proximity to the lumber industry and railroads. The company credited with being first in the mail order business was Aladdin, which started in 1906 out of Bay City, Michigan, and amazingly sold its last catalog home in 1980. Other companies active during the heyday of mail order houses in the teens, 20s, and 30s included the E.F. Hodgson Company of Dover, Massachusetts, the Ray H. Bennett Lumber Company of North Tonawanda, New York, the Gordon Van Tyne Company of Davenport, Iowa, the International Mill and Timber Company, and the Lewis Manufacturing Company slash Liberty Lewis Homes, all out of Bay City, Michigan as well, and last but not least, the Montgomery Ward and Harris Brothers Companies of Chicago, Illinois. But undoubtedly, the most famous mail order home company was Sears Roebuck and Company of Chicago. From its humble origins as a side business of Richard W. Sears, who began selling discount watches through the mail while working as a railroad station agent in Minnesota in the mid-1880s, Sears Roebuck and Company quickly grew to become the nation's most popular mail order merchandiser and later retailer, as well as America's largest purveyor of mail order homes in the period between World War I and World War II. Sears sold everything from farm equipment to fishing tackle, and by 1908, when the company launched its mail order home business under the modern home's name, a Sears catalog was practically a staple in every American home. By 1940, when the Sears Modern Homes program finally ended, the company had sold upwards of 50,000 mail order houses in over 400 different models, 
and a Sears house had become virtually synonymous with a mail order house. So to answer the question of why Sears and its competitors uh, first entered into the mail order uh, home business, historians generally cite some very broad uh, trends, including developments in building technology, um, notably the balloon frame, the increasing efficiency and broadening reach of rail transport, and the rising demand for affordable and modern homes among America's fast urbanizing population. But the story of the birth of Sears Modern Homes program is actually pretty simple starting with the fact that the company had sold building materials from its catalog since 1896. The story continues in 1906, when the head of Sears' China department, of all things, a man named Frank Kushel, was told to close the building materials department because of lackluster sales. Kushel instead convinced Sears to transform the department into a vehicle for marketing house, uh, house kits directly to the home buyer. Kushel is credited with recognizing cost savings both for Sears and for the customer, they could be achieved by volume purchasing of building materials, factory cutting of lumber and millwork, and direct shipment from the mill or factory to the customer. This was a remarkable innovation and represented really the first instance of mass production applied to the otherwise traditional building industry in America. Most Sears catalogs <coughs> prominently featured illustrations of the company's sprawling factories, lumber yards, and millwork plants as a way to inspire confidence in the quality of their product and the efficiency of their business. A Sears House catalog from 1914 touted that Sears machines do everything but think. <laughs> the Sears catalog was the primary <coughs> means of selling the mail order house to the customer, although Sears did set up sales offices in various cities and advertised home visits by personal sales representatives. The typical catalog featured an array of house models, each illustrated with an appealing depiction of the house set within a suburban landscape. Each model was also illustrated with the all-important floor plan, which showed how convenient and cozy the layout of the house was, <laughs> as well as features in included in the house kit, such as built-in bookcases, uh, kitchen ingle nooks, or sleeping porches. Sears added the ingenious flourish of naming their house models rather than simply numbering them for identification, which gave the house models personality, status, and sometimes grandiose associations. Some of our favorite Sears house model names, which are none too subtle, are the Ma Martha Washington, <laughs> the Jefferson, the Magnolia, the Hollywood, and my absolute favorite, the Olivia. <laughs> the final and most important selling point was the low advertised price for the house kit, which in 1908 ranged from the least expensive model at uh, about $650 to the most expensive model at $2,500. Because Sears wanted to appeal to as wide an audience as possible with their modern homes, they offered house models in traditional, tried and true architectural styles such as the Queen Anne, the Colonial Revival, and the Dutch Colonial Revival, also here, the Tudor Revival, here, and the Spanish Mission or Mediterranean style, and the Craftsman. In the 32 years of selling houses, Sears offered only three models uh, designed in avant-garde styles, namely the Prairie and the Modern. modern. <laughs> Sears Modern Homes customers were encouraged to customize their houses, and the catalogs advertised floor plans that could be flipped, different finishes or materials chosen, and porches or dense corners could be added or removed. Customization was an important selling point for the home buyers because it helped disguise the faster made of the mail order house. It wasn't an unusual for the various mail order house companies to prevent, present very similar, if not nearly identical, house models. And this was because companies would sell whatever they knew to be popular with the customer. They would often crib house designs from each other, or directly from the architectural press, into introducing just enough variation to call it their own. A good example can be seen here with the Sears Cambridge model on the left, and the Montgomery Ward Maywood model on the right, both from catalogs from 1931. Sears houses have typically been associated with America's suburban middle class, but actually Sears and other catalog homes were purchased by a wide range of customers from working class city dwellers to major industrial corporations like Standard Oil, which ordered 192 Sears houses for its workers in Carlinville, Ohio in 1919. The image here on the upper left shows Standard Oil's Sears houses under construction. Sears houses were particularly well suited for the farmer, uh, who already owned the land that they were built on and who may have construction experience of their own. The popular image of the American farm, at least the Midwestern farm that perhaps isn't quite as old as those in Red Hook, is at least in part a product of the Sears catalog. 
But for city and suburban dwellers, Sears had sales offices where so sales representatives could personally assist home, home buyers in selecting and ordering a mail, in the ordering a house. There were even two foot scale models of Sears houses on display. Between 1911 and 1933, Sears also offered generous mortgage plans, making home ownership an even more attainable goal for many Americans. <coughs> so how was the mail order house actually put together? Virtually all Sears catalog houses after 1918 were shipped by rail from a factory and arrived on site, usually by truck, to be assembled by the homeowner or a hired builder or contractor. The most important part of the kit was the construction manual that it came with which could run to 75 pages or more, and the blueprints keyed to each piece of stamped lumber. Masonry was not included in the kit, and plumbing and electrical systems were not included either, but were offered as extras in the Sears catalog. Even considering the hidden costs that were not included in the advertised price, such as those just mentioned, and also the cost of land to build on and the cost of hired labor, Sears promoted the idea that their mail order houses were a cheaper alternative. A Sears mail, mail order house promised to save the customer money because the services of an architect were no longer required, and a mail order house could be erected in a fraction of the time it would take to build a traditional house. The expectation was that someone with basic tools and limited experience with construction could put up a Sears house, provided that they follow the manual blueprints. Sears, <laughs> Sears warned against modifying the plans or switching out any piece of material, no matter how small. As you can see in this movie still from a 1920 Buster Keaton film, this might be the disastrous result. <laughs> this film, which we watched some of on YouTube, um, we should YouTube it, um, it's called One Week, uh, 1920 Buster Keaton. It showed a young couple's ill-fated attempts to put together a kit house. And it's just one among many social commentaries on the idea of a home in a box. <laughs> So now that we've given you a general description of catalog houses in the early 20th century, we'd like you to give you an architectural tour of Red Hook and show you some of the houses that were constructed here in town during that period. Like any tour, it helps to have a guidebook, and Olivia and I were fortunate to have a very good one, a scrapbook of the buildings constructed by Frank W. Coons, contractor and builder in Red Hook. The scrapbook is now a part of the collection of the Egbert Benson Historical Society, although it had an interesting history before landing in the archives upstairs. It was created in 1932, apparently by Frank Coon's wife, Edna, who was an avid scrapbook maker. It eventually wound up in Virginia with Coons' granddaughter, who mailed it back home to Red Hook in the 1990s. Unfortunately, we don't have a complete biography of Frank Coons, and some of you probably know much more about him than we do. But we do know that he was born in 1890, and that the 1920 census lists him as a farmer. The scrapbook tells us that in 1921, he started on a second successful career as a builder of houses, and that he was active in Red Hook at least through the 1950s. The scrapbook contains snapshots of scores of buildings built or remodeled by the by Coons from the 1920s through the 1950s. Handwritten notes detail the year of construction, the original owner, and give a general address. The scrapbook has contains over 70 buildings located not here, just here in Red Hook, but throughout Dutchess County and in the surrounding counties. <coughs> Louie and I were fascinated by these photos of the Coons' houses, and we set out to see if we could find any of them still standing. To our great delight, we were able to find nearly all of the houses that Coons built here in Red Hook. On the following slides, we'll take you on a tour, showing then and now photos of many of his commissions, and in order to tie Coons' story into the larger history of catalog and mail order houses, we've organized this tour by general building types and architectural styles, and we've also attempted to match each house as best we could with models from Sears catalogs or from other mail order companies. So the first type of house built by Coons was the bungalow. Um, and the bungalow uh, was characterized by its small scale, its low-pitched roofs with deeply overhanging eaves and exposed rafter ends, you can see here. Um, it also usually had a porch, um, with really heavy columns um, and was faced in rustic materials like shingles or cobblestones, which you can see here in the porch piers. Oh. <clears throat> the house pictured here is Frank Coons' own house, which was the first house he built and was uh, completed in 1922. Um, it closely resembles the Brandon model, which was offered in Sears' 1920 catalog on the lower left. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, but also models offered by the Harris Brothers in the center and Gordon Van Tyne. And they all have that low pitched roof, the center gabled dormer, uh, front porches that are sort of wide and graceful, uh, but at the same time a cozy and a small house. Most architectural history books define bungalows as a one or one and a half story house. Um, those that were any taller were called semi bungalows. And this house, which um, was built for Frank Jacoby on North Broadway, is actually two and a half stories. So we can call it a semi bungalow. And this term actually shows up in Kunz's scrapbook. It was called a semi bungalow. Um, and it's similar to the model offered by Bennett Homes. Um, you can see on the bottom. And Bennett Homes was a mail order house company near Buffalo, New York. Uh, this house, built for O.H. Lewis, is perhaps more of a textbook example of the bungalow. Um, and like the jaunty sunshine offered by Aladdin on the lower left, um, and also the almost identical Aberdeen, also offered by the homes on the lower right, this house um, has a long, low profile and rear extension, and a low porch with four columns. The Rodney Plum bungalow in Upper Red Hook um, was one of three houses built by Coons adjacent to the historic Plum farmhouse in Upper Red Oak. Um, the Sears Bologna on the lower left um, is a pretty close match to the Plum house. The houses have an almost identical side gable roof line, a gable dormer again, and projecting rafter ends that become a decorative feature of the house. A second important house type that Coons built was the four square, also known as the box or the American basic house. It was a prevalent building type found throughout America during the heyday of the mail order house and is widely considered a building type indigenous to the early 20th century American suburb. The four square gets its name from its shape, which is basically a two story box with four rooms on each floor. Four squares usually have a hipped or pyramidal roof with a center dormer and sometimes side dormers, and most have a full or a half width porch along the front. The four square is generally considered a building type rather than, a, than an architectural style since a wide variety of detailing could be applied to this general form. The Ralph Moore house here on the left and the Crockwell house on the right are nearly identical, although a close examination of the detail shows subtle differences, such as the placement of the chimney, the tr treatment of the porch columns, and differences in the original siding. Nearly every mail order company offered similar four square models, but the Ames model from Gordon Van Tyne and the Bellevue from Montgomery Ward are the closest matches that we were able to find. And this is another house from the Plum Family Farm subdivision in Upper Red Hook. We're actually not 100% sure if Frank Coons built it, although the scrapbook does indicate he later owned and worked on it. The original two-tone siding, which uh, has clabbered on the first story and shingled second story, was typical of uh, many of the four square designs, including model number 566 from Ben. Gordon Van Tyne's 1920 catalog. The Henry Shaw residence in Upper Red Hook has many elements typical of the four square, although we were unable to find a match in any of the catalog designs, particularly, or um, perhaps because of this grand wraparound porch. The house is located on, uh, on the top of the rise facing west and may have views of the Catskills, so it seems likely to us that this would have been a case of an experienced builder uh, adapting a popular plan to a particular building site and for the needs of a particular client. The Colonial Revival Style House was probably Sears' most popular house style after the bungalow. The Colonial House of the early 20th century was usually two stories tall with a portico entrance, um, side wings you can see here in porch form, um, and windows and doors were usually treated symmetrically and often had shutters. And the Colonial House was meant to evoke patriotic associations with America's early history and was a good choice if you wanted to identify yourself as old American stock, whether or not you were. <laughs> this is the James Riffenberg Senior House on the upper left, uh, which is now the Gaslight Inn in Upper Red Hook, and it's an excellent example of the Dutch Colonial Revival style, which is a subset of the Colonial Revival. The hallmark of the Dutch Colonial Revival style is the gamble roof, you can see well in profile here. Uh, and this house is very similar to Sears, Gordon Van Tyne, and Bennett Holmes models seen on the bottom, um, which all supported Blasky names like the Clarendon, <coughs> the 
Cheltenham, and of course, Sears is Martha Washington. <laughs> Here's an example of a smaller colonial type, and this was a house Coombs built for George Miller. Um, it closely resembles the Sears Puritan and Aladdin's Plymouth on the lower right. Here we see three Coombs houses that are almost identical, demonstrating that he probably used one house design for many different clients, making slight changes like flipping the entrance portico or the side winger porch or the chimney from one side of the house to the other. On the left is the Lee Houston house, in the center is the Russell Plum house, and on the right is the Roland Renzel house. These three Coons houses are close matches to Montgomery Ward's Rochelle on the lower left from 1925 and Gordon Van Tyne's Hartford model from 1929. And we know that Gordon Van Tyne contracted out some of its mail order business, um, uh, sorry, Montgomery Ward contracted out some of its mail order business to Gordon Van Tyne, which explains why their, many of their house models are identical, basically. And the Alba Teeter house is one of the grandest houses built by Coons and Red Hook. Um, and for this house, Coons chose the Tudor Revival style, which is one of the most popular revival styles in the 1920s. The style is defined by faux half timbering over stucco, which you can see here, a prominent chimney, you can see here, and a picturesque and varied roof line, all features that were meant to evoke Old England. Surprisingly, Tudor Revival houses are not so common in Red Hook, and this appears to be the only one built by Coons. So, as with most small town carpenters, Frank Coons had a various practice that included not only the new residential construction that we have just seen, but also other building types such as barns, summer cottages, and garages. He also renovated many buildings throughout town with porch additions apparently being a specialty. The Coon scrapbook depicts several barns, although the Cookingham barn, shown here, is the only one we were able to definitively identify. Sears offered barns in its early home catalogs and later produced a separate catalog for barns and other farm buildings from 1918 through 1934. The Gambrel roof profile, including the flared eaves seen on many 20th century barns, was popularized in part by Sears offerings and was influenced by advances in both farming and construction techniques that make these structures very different from some of the earlier post and beam barns seen on some of Red Hook's older farms. Coons also built a number of cottages at the Red Hook Golf Course. Summer cottages were offered by most of the mail order catalog companies in addition to the year-round houses. They're often of lighter construction and smaller in scale and may not have offered uh, insulation, which would not be good on a day like today. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the houses that Coons built in Red Hook also had a detached garage towards the rear of the lot. This catalog on the right from the Aladdin Company has a variety of models, including the Studebaker and the Ford, reflecting the growing <laughs> which reflects the growing popularity of the automobile in the American suburb. The multi-paned doors and the hardware in the LaSalle model are particularly close matched to some of the garages in Red Hook and can still be seen on some of those uh, that still exist in town. Well, Frank Coons was a prolific builder here in Red Hook, and his scrapbook provides an important look at the residential development of the 1920s and 30s. He wasn't the only one in town to produce houses that resemble catalog houses. A number of excellent examples can be found around town, uh, such as these bungalows pictured here, um, as well as a number of colonial revival examples. Um, the house on the upper right is a good example of the colonial style Cape Cod, a small house type that became popular later in the 1940s and 50s. While four squares were only popular for a couple of decades in the first um, part of the 20th century, they are numerous around Red Hook, as you can see. That one on the upper right hand corner looks very familiar. <laughs> 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 we expected we'd be showing some people their own houses. <laughs> We promised to give you a talk on catalog homes here in Red Hook, and we have seen that there are many houses in town that do closely resemble the designs from Sears and other companies, but we haven't actually answered the question of whether any of these houses were actually mail order kit homes. The frustrating answer for us is that we can't definitively attribute any of Red Hook's early 20th century houses to a catalog design. As you can see with these two comparisons here, we did find a handful that were near perfect matches uh, based on visual analysis alone, but the reality is that without other forms of evidence, we can't be 100% sure that it's a catalog house. 
The smoking gun, as it were, in identifying catalog houses is finding stamped lumber in the attic or basement of the house itself. This probably involves crawling around inside an attic or basement to get a good look at floor joists or ceiling rafters. Sears stamped each piece of lumber with a number of letter code, which you can see here in this photo, and sometimes you might also find uh, a shipping label attached to the lumber. Other clues, in other clues include finding Sears hardware and fixture inside your house, such as doorknobs and bathroom sinks. Another sure way to determine if it's a Sears house is uh, documentary evidence, such as local building permits, mortgage records, or shipping receipts. Here's a building permit from the bungalow in the Bronx that we showed you at the beginning, beginning of the presentation. It's a little tough to make out, but Sears and Roebuck is listed as the architects here. So what we've shown you today um, is just an introduction to the broader history of catalog houses in 20th century America. But we hope that our look at Frank Coons and his houses has brought this history to life and given you a glimpse of Red Hook 100 years ago. And maybe some of you are going to go home now and look in your attics and look in your basement <laughs> and stamp lumber and the telltale signs of the mail order house. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>
a really tough question to answer unless you have um, the right kind of um, documentary archival evidence. And it's also important to note that a lot of builders, especially if they're a good builder, were derisive of architects and plans and they felt they could do it better. So I wouldn't be surprised if Frank Coons thought he could do it better and followed his own plans. Yes? To answer the uh, cobblestone uh, question, um, over in Ulster County is where they got the cobblestones. There's a um, very small cottage um, on uh, Platt Avenue that was built by cobblestones. And it, when I interviewed the woman there, um, she, her family had lived there and had built the house and um, told me that the cobblestones came from Ulster County. That's fascinating. So, you know, nothing to say that that's not where they came, but yeah. from the riverbeds, yeah. from the humbling stones. Mm -hmm. In the back there. Well, um, I can't guarantee it, but Frank W. Cruz was my great uncle. And I'm pretty sure that they were mail order homes uh, that he built. Yeah, mm -hmm. that he built. Mm -hmm. And a, the L.B. Teeter House, which is across from the Memorial Park here, was his pride and joy. Uh -huh. I can see why. <laughs> I, I could not understand why I don't remember him building any of the houses, but talking about them and driving around and showing us the houses that he had built. And now that I see the dates, I understand why, because I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. That's fascinating. Um, uh, just another note that maybe a builder such as your great uncle would buy a house plan and, and including the package of lumber, but they might build it and make a few changes here and there to put their signature on their stamp. So in a way, it could be both a catalog mail order house and the builder's own house. So. And actually, someone brought in some actual house catalogs, including oh, some oh, oh, oh. house plans from local Amazing. companies. So this is the Hudson Lumber and Supply Corp. And we found just... Where were they based out of? They were based Hudson. in Hudson. Hudson. And just looking through this, we found uh, a model fairly similar to, to this one, which is perhaps the closest match we've, we've yet seen. So it's possible that it's a small or local firm that we just haven't come across yet, but certainly this one is by far closer than anything we've seen so far. Yes. So I have um, a 12th Reddy Street as my home, which is one of the four squares, and uh, just out of curiosity, I've done quite a bit of research since I've moved in. Um, a story, and then I have a question for you to follow up. So a number of years ago, I worked out of the house for, during the day, and I caught some people outside taking some photographs of the house, so I casually walked outside and asked what was happening. So um, they claimed to be uh, two people who were doing some research for Bard about the four squares, the, the catalog homes up and down Route 9, which apparently from, I think, as far north as Troy all the way down to Poughkeepsie, there's a number of them, including our model, which is one of the ones they are cataloging, which I know there's a, a number of them around town. Uh, unfortunately, they never, I gave them my contact information, never heard back from them. So somebody else did some information that might be scouring the internet, can't find that. Um, I've, there's a stamp on a piece of molding in my house from Iroquois Lumber. And I know the house was built in 1926, and Iroquois was in operation in Troy around that time, so I have a feeling that, that has, that there's some relationship there. Um, you said you stand and, are you representing all the books that were built by Mr. Coons, or is there we, we tried to show most of the, the buildings he built in Red Hook. I think right. there are a couple that we didn't identify or we weren't able to find, but I think that might have been two or three houses. So just about anything you built in Red Hook we showed. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. In the back there? Yeah. Can you say something about one of the architecture incorporated porches in most of these uh, houses? That's that a really good question. Um, I would say because they were copying the most popular styles of the time that were featured in architectural magazines. Um, so and, yeah. The bungalow style certainly was an imported style from California, which maybe in a, a sunnier climate, a deeper porch would make a lot more sense than it does here in Red Hook. Yeah, so you can argue that the porch is a, a kind of a adaptation of local or regional climate or, or landscape, but you could also argue that it's a sty purely a stylistic feature. Um, such as on this house, where you can see it's um, kind of 
the point of it is to show off the half timbering and the, the strong timbers that were used to construct this house and that evoked post and beam construction, which this house is, you know, balloon frame construction from the late 19th century, so. And since the catalogs were national companies, they wouldn't necessarily tailor the designs to local climates necessarily. And that's why in Red Hook, I think a lot of the porches have been enclosed because it doesn't make as much sense to have an open porch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a comment on his uh, uh, statement. The uh, Iroquois millwork, I have, in fact, I bought some wood to the Iroquois. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Did you that was. My house? <laughs> <laughs> I'm researching my house. I live over on Rockaby Road on the corner. And it was Raymond. Coon house. And all the molding says Iroquois Mill Works, the windows do. Uh, F. W. Lee, Barrytown, New York, which I think is the lumber yard that they bought Iroquois Mill Work through. Uh, I don't think my house is a catalog house. I just think it's a modern type construction with, you know, bought millwork house. Uh, but I don't really know that much about it. And mine, mine was built, I think, around 1920. I'm trying to narrow that down, but I haven't so far. Uh, in response to that comment, uh, Lee may have been, in fact, a local builder uh, who took delivery at the Barrytown Freight House uh, by on materials shipped from Troy uh, by rail. Uh, this is this is absolutely inspiring, and uh, some of us here know that uh, well, probably 15 years ago uh, we did a survey of important architecture that predated 1850 in the town. Uh, don't think it included the villages, but it may have. Uh, and that survey. Uh, exists, and I hope it's being used from time to time, uh, uh, usefully, by the town planners and others. Um, but it's, it cut off in 1850. We were arbitrary about that. Uh, and uh, years before that, we had talked about surveying just 18th century buildings in the town. You have moved us well into the 20th century. And somebody who has shown the way is Marilyn uh, Hatch from Rhinebeck, who, who surveyed not only the village of Rhinebeck, but increasingly uh, much of the town looking for significant architecture, and has gotten that listed in the National Register. And it's one of the, one of the objectives that we have with the Historical Society, I think, uh, moving forward from our own town by Sudanian. Uh, to do this kind of survey of uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th century uh, architecture uh, and uh, important landscapes and farmscapes uh, and streetscapes uh, in, in Red Hook. And uh, this, is a, this is inspiring uh, uh, for those of us who still want to get on with that work. One other comment I'd make uh, about porches. Uh, I, I think it wasn't just uh, uh, something that came from warm weather uh, climates uh, that people were simply packing out of their houses here. It, in, the, in a village in the early 20th century, there really was a, a community that uh, in time, uh, perhaps in the late in the day or in the evening, in the summer, focused on uh, the uh, residential neighborhoods and their porches. People sat on the porches and they visited back and forth, walking on the sidewalks. We can't imagine such a thing now in this age of the air conditioner and the television and the automobile. But it really was a village in those days. And I think at least in the village, maybe not so much out in the countryside, uh, porches were a very important uh, piece of the cement for community life. Thanks very much for what you're doing. Just one additional comment. I know you said you, this would be shared, the PowerPoint and the um, DVD. I would, I would suggest that for the purpose of people doing more broad research that um, slideshare.net for the slides might be a good idea, um, which can be searched and indexed and all that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Just real quickly, this is that Nick Lowland that said the, when we were on tour with your parents actually for, for research on the pattern book, um, porches we, we noticed in the older neighborhoods in the village were very important as, as an architectural device as well, the transition from the public realm of the street to the more private realm of the house. 
And again, the socialization aspect of meeting your neighbors on the porch, you know, maybe outside of the, the functional need of climate control and shade, uh, became a very important social function as well, meeting your neighbor on the porch. Um, some of the other aspects, you said that they didn't ship um, masonry or, or, but there were, in, I believe, forms you could buy to, to make your own concrete block. Yes. And some of the shapes are rusticated. Um, you can actually make your own block with foundations and whatnot. And we've seen some examples within the village as well on that, mm -hmm. which is very important to see. And, um, again, I appreciate your work on this. And, Hopefully the, the transcripts are available so we can include some of it in our family books. Sure. Daddy? No, yes. I, have, I have a series building out in Milan. Uh, the two-car garage it was uh, neglected for many years, and when I bought it, it was falling down. I thought I was going to tear it down, but uh, it was in pretty good shape inside, so I took a loader and straightened it out and completely rebuilt it, and uh, my neighbor came next, uh, next door came over and said that was a a uh, series building built by Dutch Co builders, Roy Jacoby, and his partner from Elizaville. Right after the first uh, uh, job they had, they got out of the Army from World War II. Mm -hmm. As, uh, he says roughly 1946 47. Mm -hmm. it's that, we need the transcript. What yeah. you just yeah. said. Because yeah. 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 that's the stuff you can't find when you're looking. We put the bicentennial calendar together, which is on sale today, by the way, up uh, at the cheap price. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you can't find that kind of documentation. Mm -hmm. So please, anybody who's here has any kind of documentation, you need it for the historical society. This, uh, this uh, book of, of photos is, is rarer than a hen's tooth, believe me. And to have it in the possession of the archives and to have this uh, show, is just, it, it shows you what can happen to it. You just have one star with a little bit of a thread. It can build into a wonderful kind of understanding of our own uh, our own town. And just on the on the on the issue of porches, do you think that these houses? How, how big are these? Because we we we've had a variety of porches in our life as a family. We had the farmhouse, and the porch is really it's just it's it's an, it's to get out of the out of the weather kind of porch. You can't sit on it unless you line up like a bunch of rail birds, because it's not deep enough. Um, are these, do these house plans show, do they have around in any of the catalogs you've seen furniture placed, you know, in the kind of ideal porch setting? Usually the, the plans wouldn't show furniture or anything. Uh, but they would, in catalogs, give illustrations of the living room, the dining room. Um, they had the model that we showed you in the very beginning, the city island bungalow, had a sleeping porch in the back. And who knows, you know, that's what they called it. Um, now it's enclosed. But um, these bungalows in particular were tiny houses by today's standards, about 800 square feet, no more. Mm -hmm. So the porch would have been added living space. Um, but Sears offered to, Sears wanted to sell you, not just the house, but all your furnishings. And so I'm sure they sold porch furniture. <laughs> but I think with porches, it really is important as a transition from the outside to the inside, especially because on a lot of these houses, the, the main front door would open right into the living room. There wouldn't be a There was no longer a, a formal vestibule. Yeah, foyer, parlor, yeah. hall, or whatever. All that was at the Victorian house, which that plan was obsolete by the time these houses were being constructed. Yeah. Were these uh, houses, anyway, one along Route 9 here, were they built on, like, Speculation? It's possible. Because but it looks so uniform. I mean, everyone is distinctive in a sense, but they look well placed and positioned, and it seems that, you know, an ordinary Joe that just needed a roof over his head wasn't. <laughs> well, we wanted to have to more time for. to research that very question because we noticed that in all the Clum family houses we showed you, well, there were four right in the line next to the old farmhouse from the 19th century. So we thought, oh, obviously the Clum farm, at some point, they decided to you know, sell off a portion of the farm, subdivide it. And in that case, it seemed like they subdivided um, their land to give enough lots to build houses for their children. But it could be that along Route 9 north of here, you had farms on either side of Route 9 that were maybe sold in their entirety uh, on, to, to make money you know, and build houses on speculation. So. 
but I would say, because the Kuhn scrapbook always lists an owner for every single house <laughs> shown in the scrapbook, that they were probably built for a specific client, not on speculation. At least the, you know, the houses that Frank Kuhn's built. Is the plum I can answer the question on the plum houses. The plums had three sons, and every one of them was built for the sons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, ja uh, Pete Lawson uh, and his wife Janice. Janice was a plum that was her mother and father's house. Um, next door was a Rodney plum, and I'm not sure what the other one, was, who, what his name was, but they were, it was a family farm and they were all built for those people. They, they were, you know, they knew who the house was being built for. And to my knowledge, most of the houses that he built were for specific people that he had been contracted to build for. And I wanted to tell you about his house, the bungalow. I guess you're going back to it. Huh? We're going back to it. <laughs> okay, the bungalow, if you notice where the, well, this over here on the, the uh, right is the one that he lived in. And that, of course, has a porch. But they also built onto that house. Now this house over here looks like it might be wider than, than the bungalow on the right. Well, they built onto that, made it larger, and they also included a big sun porch. And the sun porch was their pride and joy. And people, we did go there, and we did sit out on that porch when the weather was nice. And of course, in the wintertime, they had to close it off because it was too cold there. But they had, the house was small, except when he put the addition on, then they had a huge, great big living room. The kitchen was very small. Uh, there was not a dining room. Uh, there was a small room in the front uh, on the left-hand side was an office. That was his office where he did his contracting work. Upstairs was not really finished off. He did finish it enough to have a bedroom up there. And they had a huge, great big attic. So you could walk up there and, you know, it was, but it was not really finished off. Downstairs in the back, they had two bedrooms in the back. That's really illuminating to be able yeah. to sort of you know, mentally walk through a house like this. Right. And one of the reasons why Sears houses were so affordable is because often they'd be sold where you wouldn't necessarily have a finished second story, so it's right. a cheaper house. And it did have a basement. Let's do this real quick, and this is pure speculation, but is there any relationship between the amount of Sears homes that are in the village or close by to the railroad that used to run through the village? The ease of delivery and I mean, is there something probably to be attached? <laughs> um, Certainly that's one of the reasons why Sears House is developed in the first place, is the you know the standing rail networks. Yeah, yeah, and that was an important part of the mail order houses. Um, the Sears house or the pre built houses in Rhinebeck were delivered to the Rhinecliff train uh, station, and then people would take their wagons or whatever down and take them off the car um, and deliver them to the property. So uh, I don't know if that was the same here or not, but they were delivered on a flatbed rail car. Yeah, they say that the typical house kit came with 30,000 pieces wow. of house. <laughs> so the, the smaller ones would be in a single And 75 pages container. of instructions. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been difficult to trench uh, from the New York Central to the Central New England uh, at Rhinecliff. It, it probably wouldn't have been worthwhile. Uh -huh. uh, now, if, if it was going to Pine Plains or something, it might have been. But, yeah. but for Rhinebeck and Red Hook, they yeah. would have just picked it up. Yeah. At, and there was a Sears lumber lumber mill um, opened in Fort Newark, New Jersey in 1926, expressly to serve the East Coast market. So 
Um, my little bungalow in the Bronx has speculated that maybe the lumber came from Port Newark. It's possible, but don't know for sure. <laughs> was famous as Alice told me uh, for her scrapbooking and what if and, and then a granddaughter I gather who the, the first page of this album says it was found in a yard sale in Virginia and they would it was sent to the town clerk in Red Hook so I don't know if she's the one who found it in the yard sale or she had it but it's interesting yeah very much whether she put it in the yard sale Right, she so was very proud of those. The I scrapbooks. think that that must be wrong. The the little story in the I, front of the scrapbook. I think it must, must yeah. be. I, as far as I know, she donated the uh, scrapbooks. The granddaughter. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks to her for donating that because without that scrapbook, we wouldn't no. know what we know now. So, and then. Um, Lastly, I want to thank two other people who wanted to be here, Dick and Carleen Wainwright, wanted to come, and they couldn't because they, they're now down south. But they uh, said that they wanted to contribute to the refreshments. So <laughs> there are refreshments next door, and Olivia and Chris will be there. So if anybody has more questions, we can talk some more and, and watch the snow fly outside. <laughs> Thanks for coming.